Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for this day, for the opportunity to assemble during the middle of the week, to study your word and to engage ourselves in devotion unto thee. We're thankful, of course, Father, especially for thy son Jesus, in whom we do have salvation uh, from our sins. And Father, we uh, pray that we can do all that we can in this life to honor and glorify his name. Father, we are thankful for this series. We're thankful for Brother Bland and his work and and for the message he'll deliver tonight. And Father, we pray that if there are those uh, here tonight or throughout this series that need to respond in obedience to the gospel, we pray that they'll do so. Forgive us of our sins and go with us now, for it's through Christ we pray. Amen. Well, I certainly do appreciate this invitation of being with you this evening. Is this mic working okay? Yeah. All right. Number 14 must be working okay. Then. I have no idea why it's 14, but there's a reason, I am sure. If you study <clears throat> materials on how to get things accomplished during a day, they tell you the first thing you do is do the most, well, they have a way of putting it, but I won't bring it up out here tonight. It was... Anyway, do that which is most despised first. And then you'll have a great rest of the day. <laughs> Everything's going to be better. There's a reason why they had me first. <laughs> 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 and that if you have something for which to really look forward uh, throughout the rest of this summer series. But I'm glad to be with you tonight. Uh, and I hope that the lesson will be a great encouragement to you. Like I used to tell them back home as I was preaching there, I said, I don't know if you get anything out of my lessons or not, but I do because I have to get them up, and it helps me. So I'm appreciative of this subject that's been given to me, and our subject this evening is indeed Jesus, and it's really Jesus, our Savior. Jesus, our Savior. Some ways a very basic topic, in other ways, very profound topic. And so I'd like for us to think about some things as it relates to Jesus, our Savior. If you have a question or comment, if you raise your hand, I might recognize you. I doubt that I'll hear you if you're very far back that way. So you might uh, raise your hand if that is the case. In Matthew chapter 1, in verse number 21, when we're reading about the birth of Jesus, you will recall that the angel says that Jesus is going to be born, but they, the angel gives some very specific instructions and said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, but why? Why? Why is his name Jesus? All right, for he shall save his people from their sins. Okay? Jesus reiterated his purpose. In Luke 19 and verse number 10, you remember when he was in the house or the home of Zacchaeus. It says, For the Son of Man is come to do what? To seek and to save that which is lost. Now these scriptures that we're giving then go right in with our topic. Jesus, our Savior. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his purpose then for coming to this earth. This statement that I came to seek and to save the lost encapsulates then the very mission and the purpose of Jesus. He did not forget his mission. He did not get distracted from his mission. And thus he very precisely then stated why he came. Interestingly, we'll go over to John 3.16 if you will, and we'll go through John 3.16 through 18 we'll notice that he came not into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Now here's an important question. Why did he not come to condemn the world or judge the world? The world is already condemned. It didn't need him to come and condemn the world. If the world is condemned, what did it need? It needed a Savior. And that was then why he came. But let's note this in John 3, 16 through 18. It says, for the, 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Consequently, it's saying then that the world is already condemned and is in need of a Savior. What does the word Savior mean? That's right, deliverer. <laughs> All right. That's the way I do our students when the one answers. I say, that's right, or if they give the wrong answer. I say, that's right, and then I give the right answer. It means deliverer. And we probably remember that, but if we haven't said it for a while, it, it kind of leaves our mind. Jesus, our Savior. Jesus is the Savior, but what does that mean? That means He is our deliverer. The question now is, deliver us from what? You see, implied in the idea of being delivered is the idea, I need to be delivered from something. There's something from which then I need to be delivered. I need to be rescued from something. Our sins. Did you know that a lot of folks don't really think that sin is that bad? I don't know that I really need a deliverer Maybe somebody to help me in my life a little bit and reform me a little bit, but not necessarily deliver me. You'll recall in John 8, 32, when Jesus said, Ye shall know the, the truth. truth and the truth shall make you free. How did the Jews respond to that? We don't need free. Free from what? We've never been in bondage to any people. But especially they did not need to be delivered from their sins. The name Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. Now Jesus is not the only, Jesus Christ is not the only person with that name. There have been others. In fact, there's an Old Testament character that basically has the same name. Joshua. Joshua. Great study within itself. Interestingly, there's not anything said negative about Joshua. Although I'm sure he must have sinned because all of sin to come toward the glory of God. But, but here we find though Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is really not Jesus' name, is it? He's Jesus the Christ. What does the word Christ mean? Messiah. Messiah. That's right. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, but it means anointed one. Messiah, maybe that's what it means. Okay, it's the same uh, as the Hebrew Messiah. The word Messiah is found only four times in the Bible. The word Christ, I think, is found 550-something times, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> but Jesus is the Messiah. We wouldn't think of calling Him Jesus Messiah. We think of calling Him Jesus Christ. But He is Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. He is the Anointed One. Now, who was it particularly that was anointed under the Old Testament system? Priests, kings. kings, and prophets. Jesus Christ was a prophet. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God spoke to us through him. He was also a priest. He bare our sin. He's also a king. Sat down on the right hand of God. So prophet, priest, and king found in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Jesus Christ then is uniquely qualified to be man's savior. Let's deal first of all then this afternoon. Why do we need a Savior? Why do we need a Savior? You know, there's a section of humanity which believes that they are self sufficient. They don't need a Savior. In fact, could care less about the truth. I suppose you could go to the humanist as to fit that type of category. And I mean secular humanists. If you read the Humanist Manifesto 1, 2, and I think now 3 that has come out, you will see that 
They don't need a Savior. In fact, man is God. You're your own God. We are self-sufficient. You see it in that regard. Uh, and so that comes across, and in fact, their, their tendency nowadays is try to educate the children that you're good without God. Okay? You're good already again, without God. You don't need a Savior. And so there's a section then who just simply flatly rejects the idea that we need a Savior. So Jesus the Savior doesn't mean anything to them because they don't think they need a Savior. But then there's another section that seeks the truth through philosophy and worldly wisdom. While they might believe in a supreme being, truth is found not necessarily in the Word of God, but through the wisdom of men and so on. And consequently, they would think that truth and sin are subjective. Now what do we mean that truth and sin are subjective? How you interpret it. How you feel about it. Right? Truth is what you believe. Therefore is truth. That is truth to you. They would tell us. And sin is what you believe about sin. It's not necessarily something based on an objective standard. And so it has a tendency to minimize the need of knowing the Word of God. It may be, be good to read it and understand it. Has some good, some of it is inspired, I suppose. But, you know, they're really reading a lot of works of men. Uh, and I find this, especially is this the case out here in the religious world outside the church, where people are really drinking at the fountain of human wisdom when it comes to about God. And you see it on the telly of magic, make everybody feel good about themselves and, uh, and so on. But then there's another group who might think that there is an objective standard and that sin is real, but we minimize sin. Sin is really not all that bad. And the consequences of sin aren't really that bad. So we excuse sin by saying, that's just the way I am. Or it's somebody else's fault. Couldn't be mine. I made a mistake. But if we all make mistakes, say I minimize that. And the consequences of sin, you know, God is like a grandfather. He's a good person. He's not going to send me to hell. I have good thoughts and Therefore, I'm not really all that bad. And so we began to minimize sin. And consequently, we minimize salvation. Because we look at the death of Christ. And we see the abuse that Jesus went through. I mean, when they spit in His face. And when they put, the crown, they put that crown of thorns on His head. And when they tore open His back with that when they nailed him to the cross and they left him there to die and they mocked him even while he was on that cross that tells me sin must be pretty bad sin separates us from God it separates us from God and he knew that didn't he now then all of a sudden then sin is becoming more important to recognize what it is doing to me right and consequently, God knows the effects of sin. But here's the point. The Word of God does not spare our pride and our self-exaltation. It doesn't spare that. It tells us what sin is. Okay? It tells us what our condition is. It states that our condition outside of Jesus Christ is lost. Okay? It also says that we are condemned. Have you ever seen anyone stand before a judge and, you know, they think that maybe I'm going to get away with this and then when the sentence comes down and it's a little bit more harsh than what they thought it was going to be and all of a sudden, this, this just can't happen. <laughs> this just cannot happen. Uh, I've had to, <laughs> to deal with some things and, in, a, in a way, and I, won't, I guess I ought not to get into things like this. I think there's been a reformation in the boy's life, but we had a student here a number of years ago 
And unfortunately, I've been here about 20 years now, so you have no idea who I'm talking about. All right? It was my first year, you won't know who I was. But I remember uh, this, you know, we have a strict rule on smoking over here at the school of preaching. <laughs> you can't do it. All right? And so now then, but this boy admitted he was smoking, and I said, well, I read the rules to him, and I said it is subject to immediate dismissal. This was a number of years ago, okay? I remember his reaction was, he said, that won't work. <laughs> I said, excuse me, he said, that won't work. And I said to the young man, I said, not only will it work, it already has worked. I said, now you can make an appeal to the director of the school, uh, and we'll be happy. That's nothing personal, but you violated this rule. Let me read this rule to you again. We read it again. Guess what he said? That won't work. And I said, it already has worked. I said, I had a hard time convincing him. Yes, that's it. You are no longer a student at the school. He said, if you allow me to be dismissed, get the way you put it, it's probably not that nice, but he said, it will destroy my faith. That's my fault. See? If I dismiss him, it is my fault that he's going to be lost. He said, I'll lose my faith if I leave this school. I said, sir, let me tell you something. This school is not here to create faith in you. You're to have faith in you come. You're, you're here to prepare to be a gospel preacher. This is not a reform school. So you, you might need to decide what you want to do with your life. Now, so I think everything worked out. And I think he's going to turn out to be a gospel preacher, hopefully one who doesn't smoke. But, but at any rate, I just thought of that reaction. I actually, on another occasion, well, this is I'm confessing all their sins. But, those are a lot easier to confess. But I, I, on another occasion, a man turned in a turned paper to me that I knew was not his. I mean, it was written on a doctorate level. And I knew he wasn't at that level yet. And I, I read this, and, and so what I did is I found it on the internet. And, that's, and I turned my screen around, and I called him into my office, and I held up his paper by my screen, and I said, where did you get this paper? He said, it's my paper. I said, but where, where did you get it? He said, I got it off the internet. I said, that's plagiarism. Are you calling me a liar? <laughs> I said, I'm saying you plagiarized this paper. Now, your term is a liar. Mine is plagiarizing. He said, it is mine. I downloaded it. I wrote my name on it. <laughs> on the paper, and it became mine. And... He, I mean, he looked dead serious at me. And, and I don't understand that. I, I couldn't look at my mother and lie. I mean, I knew I was going to get a beating if I got caught lying. And, and, you know, she knew about the second time she asked me, I'm going to tell my sins and my brother's sins. <laughs> and, uh, because, but I thought, I'm looking at this guy, and he's about got me convinced that it's his paper, and I'm reading it right here. <laughs> And I said, not only that, it teaches error. But that was the problem. He didn't know enough of the truth to even know what he turned in was error. But it's my fault. People don't see it anymore. It's somebody else's fault. See? So we're living sometimes in a society where sin is not all that bad. But in Romans 3 and verse 10, Paul just disallows all of that. And he said, there is none righteous. No, not one. Now that includes me. That includes you. And the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now that means I have sinned. So friends, what we need to understand is that sin is more than just making a mistake. Sin is the transgression of God's law. 1 John 3, 4, Whosoever sinneth transgresseth also the law, for sin is what? The transgressions of God's law. Whether I believe it or not, whether even I know it or not, I have transgressed God's law. That's an objective standard. And consequently, I have sinned. I need to save it. But 
Sin is also the violation of any of God's law, for all unrighteousness is sin. 1 John 5 and verse 17. I'm getting a, a picture here now. I'm the one that's sitting over there saying, I'm the one at fault now. Now, how does God feel about sin? He hates it. Not only that, He's angry. We talk about God's wrath. Someone look at Romans 1.18 for us. Romans 1, verse 18. If I'm living in sin, I should think about this. Look at Romans 1.18. It says what? The God is being revealed from heaven against all the all the godliness, godlessness, and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Or what? What is revealed? The wrath of God. God's wrath. Okay, if I'm living in sin, then what do I expect at the end? The wrath of God. God was angry with sin in Noah's day. Matthew 24. Jesus talked about that, didn't he? By the days that were before the flood, what were they doing? They were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, and knew not till the flood came and took them all away. He says, so shall also it be when the Son of Man comes. So what were they doing? Just like what we're doing today. Out here in the world I'm talking about. We're marrying. We're giving a marriage. We're just living our lives. And we're going about every day. But they're living in sin. And then the flood came and took them all away. That was they experienced the wrath of God. Sin took Israel into a Syrian captivity. In 722 B.C. God had sent prophet after prophet. But Israel would not listen. Finally the Assyrians, a very wicked and cruel people, which we don't have the time to discuss the cruel acts that they did, but you didn't want to be captured by the Assyrians. God brought the Assyrians though against them and took them into Assyrian captivity. Why? Sin. They wouldn't listen to God. Israel's sister Judah did not learn. So in 606, 596, and then 5. 86 B.C., three carries away. Babylon came and took Judah away into captivity. And there they would be, from the 606 date at least, 70 years in captivity. 70 years. Uh, I know you think I'm old, but I'm not 70 years old yet. That's longer than I've been alive. That's a long time to be in captivity, isn't it? When you think about it. Why? God's angry with sin. Here's the question. Do we think that God will simply overlook our generation? <coughs> God didn't overlook the generation of Noah's day. God didn't look the, overlook the generation back in uh, Israel's day or Judah's day. But in some way, are we the exception? Someone please read Isaiah 5 verse 20. Isaiah 5 and verse 20. Woe well, unto them that follow evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Okay. Woe well, unto them that call evil good. Do we have any in society today calling that which God says is evil, man says is good? All the time. And good and evil. You, especially you bring up God, you bring up Christ, you bring up the Bible, that's something that's taboo in our society many places. That put darkness for light. And light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet. And sweet for bitter. Calling it the very opposite. But Mike and I was serving on jury duty one time and they selected me for some reason to be the foreman. Now they don't even want me there. They usually exclude me when they learn how to preach it. But, but I remember this guy, it was obvious he was guilty. And, uh, I mean, the, uh, the attorney did a great job, the prosecuting attorney, trying to say, if you, I want, to, I want you to understand. He said out at the very beginning, I'm here to put this man in jail. If you have a problem with that, I want to know it. 
Well, that sounded pretty straightforward, didn't it? But he said, because I don't want you to get into the jury of deliberation and say you can't find anybody guilty even though you know he is. That was his purpose. Surely enough, after all of the uh, things went through, we had a lady in there that said, I just can't say he's guilty. I mean, all the evidence to the contrary notwithstanding, he's just not. We said, well, why, what, what problem did you have? What is it that you think he's not guilty? I just can't say anybody is guilty. And I said, ma'am, do you realize that it's just as wrong to, to say a guilty man is innocent as it is to say that an innocent man is guilty? And I quoted Isaiah 520 to her. She said, well, I know he's guilty. I guess if I send the Bible, I guess I'll vote guilty. <laughs> but we got that vote <laughs> They got on out. I saw a man a year later who was also on the jury duty, and he said, Preacher, if you hadn't been in on that jury duty, we'd still been sitting in that jury. <laughs> what I'm saying is there is an objective standard. But the world will say nobody's guilty. If we're guilty, let's accept that. There's a, there's a way to overcome that. That's the point. But God sees us as guilty, and we're not going to, you know, just, oh, God's not going just to overlook it. If He were going to overlook sin, oh, Jesus really went through a lot of pain for no reason. If God says, don't worry about it, I'm going to overlook everybody's sin. The point is this, we need a Savior. Why do we need a Savior? Because we're guilty. We've sinned. And sin brings about the wrath of God. I like to think of it not only as an emotional anger, but the legal, if you will, wrath. Because we violated God's holiness. Not that God is angry with me as a person. But I can't live in sin because that violates His holiness. But I'm grateful then that He's merciful. Therefore, it took a sinless, one who was guiltless, to atone for my sin. You see, if Jesus had sinned, He would need a Savior. But Jesus did not sin. Therefore, He came to accept your penalty and my penalty. And He says, we can go free if we accept that. <laughs> but if we want to do it all on our own, He'll allow us to try that. There's no secondly then that Jesus is our Savior. You see, God knows our predicament. Our next two points are going to be very brief, so don't, don't worry. We'll, we'll get through all the time. But Jeremiah said, Oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. We couldn't figure it out. We didn't have the atonement. The wages of sin is what? Yeah. Death. There's what we deserve. However, when you look at Romans 5, 6, or or when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Those who were guilty. Not because they were good, but because they were so guilty. He died. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man. Some would even dare to die, but God committed His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So you see, God sees our predicament. He knew our predicament. And therefore His Son came to shed His blood because it's going to take a blood atonement for our sins. Romans 5 and verse number 9. It tells us, and it's, it's, it's significant that we know this about the blood. It says, much more than being now justified. There's that legal term. We talked about the wrath of God, the legal wrath, but now legal justification here, acquittal, if you will. But it took the blood of Jesus for my acquittal. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. Now there's my deliverance. It is through Him by the shedding of His blood. 1 John 2 and verse 2 says He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. The word of propitiation is the idea of appeasement. Wherein reconciliation then can, can be had between God and me. If someone said that sin separates us from God, but now then from, through that propitiation, I'm at one with God again, at one but, at one but you see, with God. The Old Testament sacrifices could not accomplish that. It's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. But it prefigured the blood of the Lamb. 
I want us to think for just very quickly here how great that sacrifice is. Who is it that went to the cross? God. And you said right, Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him. Verse 3. But verse 14 says He was made flesh and dwelt among us. One reason He was made flesh is so He could die. So that He could suffer. So that you and I can go to heaven. That's how great that is. You ever think about God washing your feet? What Jesus did. John 13. Amazing, isn't it? Great as God is. And I was thinking about that. I look out just at the creation alone and I just stand amazed, stand in awe of God, His creative power, His omniscience, His omnipotence. Yet there He is on the cross. It's amazing. Well, Jesus is our Savior. <coughs> Friends, there is no greater one and there is none other anybody. Acts 4.12 Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only through Jesus. Remember John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. <clears throat> Who comes to the Father aside from Him? No one. You can't sidestep Him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Now finally, let's go that since Jesus is our, we, why we need a Savior, Jesus is the Savior, where are the saved? Where did God put them? In the church. What does the word church mean? The called out is Greek term, ecclesia, compound word, called out. And so therefore, called out of what? Called out of the world. Now, that makes perfect sense. If I'm in the church, I'm not in the world because I've been called out of the world. If I haven't been called out, I'm still in the world. You see, then if I'm not in the church, where am I? In the world. If I'm out of the world, I'm in the called out. There's no other place to be. I want to be in the called out. You see, Jesus built His church then which contains the saved. Matthew 16, 18, He said, I will build my church. He had a purpose for it. In Acts 2, 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. Where did God, where does Christ put the saved? In the church. I haven't seen him place him in anywhere else. That's the only place he puts them. Is in the church. We're talking about Christ's church. You see, the church is his body, isn't it? Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Now, what what purchased the church? The blood of Christ. Now, what did we read a moment ago? I said this is very important to see this connection. Romans 5, 9, we're saved by what? His blood. He purchased the church with His blood. There's got to be a connection then between the blood of Christ and the church of Christ. If I've been cleansed by His blood, I'm in that blood ball institution called the church. The only way to meet His blood is through immersion in water for the remission of our sins, which the Bible calls baptism. Romans 5, or Romans 6, 3, and 4. Know ye not, notice this carefully, Romans 6, 3, and 4. Know ye not that as many as you as were what? Tied where? Into Christ. Oh, don't you want to be in Christ? The Savior? How do we get into baptized into Christ? How put on Christ? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in what? Newness of life. Wow, isn't that great? you got a new life. You know all that time that you were guilty, that's gone. It's, it's not only gone, it's off the record. It does not exist anymore. Justified, as the Father said, just as if I'd never seen it. The problem is, some people are not justified, they're just satisfied. Right? Are you just satisfied or are you justified? Well, I want God to be uh, satisfied. <laughs> then I'll be okay with Him. Jesus is the Savior of the body. Ephesians 5, 23. I need to be in the body. Husband is the head of the wife. And Christ is the head of the church. And He is the Savior of the body. Now then let us know also that we are saved for a purpose. 
Why are we saved? We say, well, we go to heaven. That's right, but we need to do something besides keep prayer from holding until we get there. In other words, we have a purpose about us. Titus 2.14 says what? Who gave himself for, our, uh, for us to redeem us from all iniquity, that he might purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of what? Good works. Now we've got a purpose. He's pulled me out of the world. Not just sit back and do nothing. Well, John D. Berry talks about sitting back on, a, on I'm doing nothing and leaning back on doing less. <laughs> Rather than standing on the premises, or standing on the problem or sitting on the premises. But, but he says that, no, you're, you're to be zealous now of good works. Of good works. You see where he's taking us from then? What, what that purpose of life, it puts a spring in our step. Consequently, what we have seen this evening is that we need a Savior. Jesus is the Savior. And the saved are in His church. I'd like for us to close with Luke 2, 8 through 11. And the scene is this. This is probably a very ordinary night. And the shepherds are out in the field at night in the pasture, watching over their sheep. The Bible says, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord.